Riding the rails both near and far, that's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. In its heyday, hundreds of people might have been here at any time of the day or night. We're at the former Toledo and Ohio Central train depot on West Broad. The railroads brought more than people and goods to Columbus. They also brought jobs. One innovative railroad company was vital to the city's east side, where you can still see signs of the Ralston Steel Car Company. There's something kind of interesting about walking on old railroad tracks. You're looking at the wooden ties and just imagining what the hustle and bustle must have been like around here. The railroad company starts on this site probably by about the late 1860s yes. and they're making the gun carriages for uh, heavy weapons that are going to be used in the Spanish-American War. And a gentleman uh, named Ralston came down here from Toronto and bought the Rarig Engineering Company and started the Ralston Steel Car Company and erected this building behind us um, 1910, 1915. They invented the coal hopper. A hopper car is a car built in two V's, and they opened the bottom up, and the coal fell into the coal truck. They also built gondolas and box cars. The factory run from Cassidy Avenue east all the way to James Road. You think of the Levesque Tower as being a little over 555 feet, and this is 1,900 feet, perhaps a little more. This is like three, almost four Levesque Towers, side to side. The railroad industry was jumping and jiving. They just couldn't build enough cars for Pennsylvania, New York Central, B&O, C&O. They were all giving them orders. They started the steel on this end and about 500 feet in and there were large bridge cranes inside that would take them down until they could get them on tracks. There were three tracks in each gable, pretty much made by hand and they were doing like 19 a day. Ralston made um, as many as 10,000 cars in a relatively short period of time. I'm sure they did. What's interesting is the Ralston is kind of starting up about just after the turn of the century, but before World War I. Right. And so Columbus at that point is actually getting immigrants in. There is the long-standing German and Irish community, but they're getting in uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Central Europe. That's so right. there's Hungarians and Poles and Czechs and Slavs and Slovenians and Slovakians. Right. And at the same time, it's the great migration from the South, so African-Americans, and they're correct. all looking for work. This was quite a bustling industrial community. Company houses, company infirmary, okay. their own power plant. A company town is really where the predominance of one, uh, usually manufacturing institution, controls everything. A lot of houses on 4th Avenue were owned by Ralston. 
From early photographs, we know that Ralston built a variety of different kinds of houses. Uh, some were small and cottages, some were two-story. Uh, generally, they were always framed, and most of them actually were defined by the street by little picket fences. We lived in a company house. Everybody had an outhouse. We didn't have any electric, we had gas lights, and that's the way we lived in the company house. When my father was laid off from the railroad, he was off work for about three years. He bought the house from Ralston for $1,500, and they deducted the monthly payment from his pay. When he was laid off, they never evicted anybody. And then when they got rehired at Ralston, they went ahead and let them pick up their payments right where they left off. They didn't have them pay all the back dues. Nobody was evicted. Try that today. As immigrant families settle into their new East Columbus life, many people move away from the factory work and create small businesses, such as the Tartle family who had immigrated from Czechoslovakia and the Liska family who came from Poland. Sometime in 1937, Dad opened a grocery store. It was called the East Columbus Market. And it was in a storefront on half of the building. They opened a bar on one side of the building, kept the grocery on the other. And after a couple weeks, the bar made more money than the grocery store. That was the end of the grocery. <laughs> it opened, I'm assuming, around 1935. It first shows up in the city directory in 1936. And it was called uh, North Bexley View Inn. My dad purchased it from my mother and my aunt and renamed it in 1950 to the Bar and Grill. And as a kid, you know, we always came here and worked on Sundays cleaning up, you know. Then to get out of that job, I had to go to University of Detroit, so I didn't have to work here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I graduated there in 1970, and then I started full-time here, and that's when my education started. <laughs> When you work behind a bar, you should really get the education. When Eisenhower became president, all the emphasis was put on the interstate highways. And what happened? The trucking industry hollered hurrah, but the railroad industry went downhill and Ross's Steel Car Company closed up. The last order Ross's Steel Car Company got was an order for funeral cars to bring back bodies from World War II from Europe. And my father was one of the last four people to leave that factory. So when I think of this as a place where people were working, we are talking thousands and thousands of people that are employed here. Do you have a, a sense as to when Ralston finally will close and some of the people will find other manufacturing jobs, but what are some of the first things you see about this happening in the neighborhood? Because the manufacturing part of it was gone, mm -hmm. you still had a tenant just down the tracks here, uh, the Kroger Company, which okay. was growing quite a bit. We had buildings, so they warehoused some items yeah. here. And uh, I don't know when my uh, employer got the idea to do third-party warehousing. That's mm -hmm. what he started building, was warehouses. And it was just in that that period in the late 50s, early 60s, distribution was becoming a large business here in Columbus and we are known as a distribution town, more okay. than a manufacturing town. People started to move to Gehanna. They moved out in the outskirts. That's when we all got married and yeah, everybody it was, left. It was time for us to move on. I believe it is in a situation it is today, possibly because of 670 kind of divided the community and then renters. I don't think many of the people that live around here own their own house, so they don't take care of it. Sometimes they have to be told to cut the grass. It's a lot of unemployment now, and welfare is a big part of it. I mean, a lot of people out here are on government assistance. Drugs are a big part. I mean, when you leave here, you'll beat somebody on the corner begging for money. You know, they come in and want something to drink or eat, as far as what I would like to see, I can't say that I, it'll ever happen in my lifetime. Uh, there's just too much apathy. Uh, I also belong to the Civic Association, and we have tried to have regular meetings, but, you know, that's hard. When we do have a meeting out of 4,000 
people in this community, we get five or six people show up for a meeting. So, and it's the same story with any organization. How do you get people involved? I would think that the city would be more interested in developing Fifth Avenue because of, you want to say, the gateway to 670, which is, you know, the airport. I mean, we had a couple people come here a year ago and they Googled it on their phone and found this place because they didn't want to eat the airport. And the needs today, of course, you know, the Schottenstein Corporation developed the Air Center and uh, DSW is down there and, and there's some uh, government offices. There are over 500 uh, people employed by the companies uh, in our park. So there's a lot of traffic, there are a lot of people work in this area. What we looked at as uh, members of the Business and Civic Associations here were, well what about if we had restaurants where they could eat, you know, on the way in or, or at lunch. Does eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right, you got to eat lunch. Columbus has, does a great job of, uh, of development planning, of developing uh, certain neighborhoods, and we have a plan. There's been a plan and a study over several years uh, that Cassidy will be widened and uh, roundabouts put in, and it goes on north, and in time, we'll be a support area for, for Easton, Bexley. Well, we hope those restaurants, especially with those Polish and Hungarian cabbage rolls, oh, make their appearance very soon. and. Uh, uh, old industrial sites are so attractive to people, so uh, don't overlook the possibility of a restaurant right here. That's right. <laughs> For many years, railways were not only the most convenient way to move from city to city, they were the best way to move within a city. Columbus's streetcars prospered as the city grew, and streetcar barns were strategically located to service them. We asked architectural historian Jeff Darby to tell us about these remarkable structures. <music> The streetcars started in the center of the city and radiated out really in all directions to help people get from their homes to the industries and the stores and the other places where they work. Uh, so at one point, uh, early in the 20th century, um, you could live almost anywhere in the city and be only a short walk from a streetcar line that could take you anywhere else in the city. Unlike today, where transit systems are publicly owned and operated, the streetcar companies were for-profit companies. They were expected to pay their way, pay dividends to their shareholders, pay their costs, all out of the fare box without any kind of subsidy. There's not a lot of evidence left of where the streetcars ran. You can drive down the streets that had streetcar lines, double track, single track, and not see any evidence of it at all. Uh, trolley poles are gone, the rails have been pulled up. Uh, but there's a spot in German Village on Mohawk Street where you can sort of read a shadow of the past. It's the curve onto Mohawk Street on the north side of the park where there was an extra wide radius in the curve so that the streetcars could make the curve. So when the tracks came out in the 1950s, the street was repaved in the center part and uh, evidence of the streetcar was left. I thought it was kind of a nice detail on the part of the city to put in the uh, white bricks down the center. There are several other streetcar artifacts, you might say, left in the city. In German Village, uh, and right next to German Village, there are two surviving car barns. One actually was a car barn for the horse cars and is now in office use, known as the Old World Center. The other car barn fronts onto High Street and was from a later period, uh, but both were in use by the street railway company. Once people began to buy and drive automobiles, after about 1915 or 1920, it became harder and harder for the streetcar companies to, to stay in business. To economize, uh, they started substituting buses. Columbus made a change to electric buses until the mid-1960s and used the same streetcar facilities that the electric streetcars had used, uh, but they were adapted for bus maintenance instead. And we're headed out to the car barns uh, that are still standing. This is the Oak and Kelton Car Barn Complex. This is probably the biggest, best preserved uh, collection of buildings from the streetcar period in Columbus. We're lucky to have them with us, that they haven't disappeared. This is not fancy architecture here at the car barns by any means, but it's really good architecture. It's very functional, extremely well built, a solid stone foundation, solid brick walls, big windows to provide light. These are really interesting buildings. There were several buildings in the complex, car barns, there was a paint shop, a little building for storing oil, an office building. There was a foundry for pouring brass and bronze pieces. 
uh, people had to know electricity, these things ran on probably 600 volts direct current, which is really strong electricity. So people had to know what they were doing here. Taking care of these streetcars was a very skilled occupation. This is the office building where the whole complex was managed. Uh, there, would, there would be record keeping and fares were counted here. So one of the big jobs at the complex here was to wrap up all the coins that came in the fare box every day. There was a power plant to generate its own power, steam, heat, electricity. And it all took place right here at this complex for many, many years, from the late 19th century well into the 20th century. Kota used the facility for a long time and maintained buses here, but moved to more modern facilities to their centralized location on uh, McKinley Avenue. So facilities like this just became outmoded. They weren't useful anymore. It was sold privately. Uh, we're hoping that this complex will be preserved uh, as much as possible in its current state. It would lend itself well to all kinds of uses. Uh, what the current planning is, I can't say for sure, but we certainly hope it's something that will happen sometime in the near future. Passenger trains and streetcars are long gone here in Columbus, but many people are still fascinated by them. Rail fans study every detail of depots like the one we're in today. A hot topic of conversation is the possible return of rail travel. How viable is it? We had a recent conversation about all this inside an authentic streetcar in Franklinton. We're in Franklinton at the Spaghetti Warehouse near West Broad Street. There's spaghetti with any sauce you like, meatballs, mushrooms, even one with beer and chili. Their house favorite is a 15-layer lasagna with noodles, pork sausage, ground beef, romano, ricotta, and mozzarella. It's handmade fresh every day. Today we're talking about streetcars with historian Stu Nicholson. Plus, Aparna Dial from the city of Columbus is here to discuss the future of transportation in our city. Now, Sue, uh, a lot of people don't know that Columbus is, was known as a railroad town, mm -hmm. you know, using the railroads to move people and coal. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Well, the city really grew up around railroads as a hub, and then, of course, you know, as the city itself grew, they started out, you know, putting rails in the ground in the streets and right. running horse cars. The horse cars gave way to electric you know trolleys and that's when streetcars came on yeah and and many of the neighborhoods that are that immediately surround downtown grew up as essentially streetcar neighborhoods we also had interurban cars that ran between cities which was essentially a larger trolley at one point in the in the 1920s through the early 40s we had one of the most integrated transportation systems of of any state it's going to happen again in columbus at some point and actually, I think I think what what we're seeing with with the advent of Smart Columbus, right, right, uh, I right. think is gonna is probably gonna help that along as well. So, Aparna, like we've been awarded this Smart City Challenge grant. Can you tell me more about it? Sure. So, back in December of 2015, uh -huh. uh, the federal government, the U.S. Department of Transportation, announced this big challenge for all mid-sized cities. They said, and they said we will pledge 40 million dollars to one city to help them articulate or realize what their own vision is. Is it enhanced safety for our citizens? Is it better air quality? Is it less congestion? So you name it, right? So imagine a world in which cars can talk to cars. Can you think about the safety benefits if a driver could be warned of an impending crash at an intersection or you get a signal in your car that says, hey, slow down, the weather conditions are not good enough right, right. on the road. Or think about all the mobility options that owning a smartphone has opened up for you. Right. So how do we take those it's and open it up to everybody mm -hmm. and then furthermore ensure that it's connected to something like healthcare and infant mortality? We have a lot of goals for the program and the topmost among them is affordable, reliable, access to transportation so that we can open up those ladders of opportunity for our citizens, whether it's jobs or health care, access to fresh food. So I hear you saying awareness of opportunity isn't enough, it's access mm -hmm. to that opportunity. opportunity. Mm -hmm. Paint a picture for me, when it comes to transportation, railroads, what is the future of Columbus? What do you see or what do you hope for? I think we're looking down, down the road or down the tracks uh, or down the, down the bus line or wherever <laughs> towards towards a day where you will basically have the full array of transportation options in in Columbus, both to get around within Columbus, but also to get out of Columbus and connect with other cities, whether it's in, you know, in a driverless car, uh, on, a, on a 
a bus rapid transit line, uh, streetcar, light rail, uh, inner city passenger train. These are all things that, that I think are, are, are going to happen. Um, hopefully some of them in my lifetime because I think I've been waiting way too long for some of this to happen. You deserve it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, darn it. <laughs> we have four years uh, with yeah. the Smart City Grant. Yeah. That's, so it's a four-year uh, four grant? It's a four-year grant. And then what is like what gets you excited about the Smart City Grant and what are you hopeful for? So for me, at the end of the day, it's not a technology story, it's a human story. Uh -huh. It's really about using technology to make lives better, right? So one of the biggest things that we did was to actually reach out to the community and said, what are the challenges you're facing? How do we address all of this through what seems to be a transportation? Right, right? Right. It's all about opening up that yep. affordable access to all communities because that opens up access to better jobs, better schools, better uh -huh. housing. And these are all, I think, essential pillars of the American dream. I totally, I totally that. agree. Yeah. It's, it's you, uh, what, what people forget when they talk transportation, yeah. they tend to talk modes and things like things, that. But yeah. what, what yeah. they forget about the most is that what we're talking about here is, is freedom. And mobility is the essence of the freedom that we have. We live in a state where roughly 9% of the population does not drive or have access yeah. to a car. Yeah. And to the extent that any one of us is made less mobile by whatever our circumstance, then we're all less free. Well, your excitement about the future and Stu, your excitement about the past and the future has me excited about the future of Columbus. So I really appreciate uh, you all spending time with me and uh, sharing this good meal with me as well. So thank, thank you so you. much. It was excellent. Great. Thank you very much. Glad to be a part of yeah. it. You can see thousands of artifacts and exhibits at the Ohio History Connection that transport you to another time. But there's one exhibit that you can do more than just see, and it transports too, or did in its day. Here's another edition of From the Vault. Hi, Amy. Hey, Brent. Well, this is a very moving exhibit or an exhibit about the way we used to move in Columbus. It is. Do you want to come aboard? Uh, is that all right? That's the idea. Oh, another immersive exhibit, huh? That's right. Okay, let's look. So, Amy, this was used in Columbus, but it wasn't made in Columbus, correct? That's right. It was made by the John Stevenson Company in New York. And uh, I find that interesting because we hear so much about the buggy works that were mm -hmm. going on in Columbus about that time that they didn't actually make the streetcar here. Yeah, it's really surprising to a lot of people, actually. But I'm just amazed at the uh, at the craftsmanship of this. The, the wood is beautiful. You can see this. It's kind of banded and layered and stained. Mm -hmm. A lot of care went into this. I mean, they just didn't just throw this thing together. It's yeah, there was a lot of care and detail put into these old streetcars, and we really tried to replicate that look when we restored it. You know the term strap hanger? No, I'm not familiar with that yeah, term. Yeah, that's what you call somebody who commuted on the streetcar or the subway. They still use that term, and it comes from the strap you oh, used to hold on. Wow. Here are the straps. See, They're right here. You taught me something, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emmy, this is not a recreation. This is this is the real deal, right? This is the real deal. And yeah. it was actually used in Columbus and where else? Yeah, it was used in Columbus and also in Lancaster. It began its life as a horse-drawn streetcar for the Columbus Consolidated Street Railway and it took passengers along Market Street here in Columbus. What happens between 1937 and the 1990s when you start the restoration? Where is it? It was stored in closed barns in various locations. Um, it was actually stored in really good conditions. It preserved a lot of the original elements of the streetcar, so when we received it in 1991, it was in great shape and we kind of started from there. Yeah, it really is, really is beautiful. And it's restored to the state of the, uh, the streetcar days, not the electrified days, right? That's right, that's right. It was restored to the era of 1888 when it was originally built and used here in Columbus. Is this really the color it was when it was in service? It is, yeah, it was this bright green color. We found that out by doing a paint analysis where we scraped off remnants of the original paint and we looked at them under the microscope. And in that process, you can see all the different layers of paint over the years. And we discovered this bright green color. Well, it's a fantastic piece of work and people love seeing it when they come to Ohio History Connection. Thanks for showing it to oh, us. Oh, thanks for coming. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. 
and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. On this rusty old rail car With graffiti on the side Roll through every broke down stockyard Just to end my life's long haul ride I've seen old Muskogee and Chattanooga too There ain't nothing this old boy can't do Can't do except step back in time and save you Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Algren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.